am very honored <coughs> to have these fine gentlemen here. And again, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker to talk about the ways in which he incorporates the goddess into his personal, his professional, and above all, his religious and spiritual practice and the, the significance of that for him. Patrick McCollum. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I had lost my voice and it went away entirely until just this morning, pretty much. And so I'm hoping that it will hold up because I have a number of things I was really hoping to say to you. Anyway, uh, I'm very pleased to see that we did end up, in fact, with a number of people who are interested to see what men have to say about their relationship with the goddess. Um, as a man, being in that particular situation, it's unique the way that people respond to you and me as a man. Uh, when I tell them that uh, I love the goddess, that I worship the goddess, you got a lot, a lot of very interesting responses. So I want to share a couple little stories with you to start off with to give you a sense of why I'm where I am. But the first story I'd like to tell you is how other people reconcile that I could be somebody as a man who worships the goddess. When I was uh, very young, I got hit in the head with a baseball bat. And I have had many people comment that it may well be the reason that I worship the goddess <laughs> is because the masculine side of my brain got smashed in, <laughs> making me more open to the feminine divine. And uh, since I don't know everything, you know, maybe that's possible. <laughs> but I actually think it's something else that shifted me to that place. And this is a real opportunity for me because I'm going on the far end of close to, close to 50 years of worshiping the goddess. And uh, it's very rare I get an opportunity to actually share my own personal feelings about that why I'm doing that, and what happened to me to get me in that place. But I decided that this would be a good venue for that. So this is really going to be the first time I've ever shared this with somebody. When I, in the early 60s, when I was 15 years old, I was driving on my motorcycle to go see my girlfriend, <coughs> and I went a couple blocks away, and a woman who was speeding and had been drinking ran through a stop sign and hit me going about 60 miles an hour. And the paramedics and such, or in those days they didn't have paramedics, but the ambulances and whatever came and got me, and they had a doctor on board, and they actually pronounced me dead. And I was dead with no breath, no heart or anything for six and a half minutes. And I came back from that experience. So I had what, in, in the course of it, I had what you call a near-death experience. But in those days, they hadn't even documented it. They didn't have NDE. In fact, I was actually um, part of a study for some people writing on those experiences. But after I got hit, I had this very unique experience of being drawn up to like a tunnel of light and coming to a place where a hand extended itself to me and I took the hand in a kind of very natural way, and a woman appeared to me. And she was um, neither young or old, very difficult to describe exactly what that experience was, except that one of the ways I like to relate it to my kids is it was kind of like a grandmother. Not in the sense of an old woman near the edge of, end of her life or something, but more like the kind of grandmother you'd read about in a book who's cooking uh, baking cookies in a Victorian oven and she smells like, you know, bacon and eggs and coffee and she like snuggles you in close, you know, when you're having a hard time and you need somebody. It was a very profound experience for me. And she asked me if I wanted to come. And I didn't know who I was. So I couldn't really respond to her. She asked me several times and finally I said, who are you? Now, you have to understand, at this point in time, I was a Methodist. 
And I wasn't in the drug culture. Well, it may sound like a drug culture story. <laughs> and so um, she said, I'm God. And if you ever had the opportunity to actually be in that particular situation, now, I wouldn't recommend it, but, uh, but some of you may have had profound experiences of one sort or another like this. I knew absolutely that what she said was true, that she was God. And so um, she didn't ask anything particular of me at that point in time, other than if I was ready to come with her. And I said I wasn't. And they talk about how your whole life comes back to you. And it did. My whole life went in front of me. And I thought of all the stuff that like a 15-year-old kid wants to think of. And I said, no, you know, I want to get a better motorcycle. Uh, I want to have sex with my girlfriend. <laughs> um, those kinds of things were what was on my mind. That I wasn't really thinking of as a spiritual experience so much. But she let go of my hand. She said, there'll be pain. She let go of my hand and I felt this incredible, almost funnel-like thing until all of a sudden I heard a voice we got him back, and then I was in the most incredible pain. I woke up, and I had a chunk of concrete that my jaw had dislocated, and I'd gone about 50 feet out. I went through the woman's window on the side and out the windshield. And uh, I had a big chunk of concrete in my mouth, which they had to get out. But as I came to, even though I was screaming, I was telling the ambulance people, I saw God. And they're going like, what? You know, you just were dead. And I go, God was a woman. <laughs> and the paramedic was with me and said, Don't worry, son, you're going to be okay. <laughs> so, this was kind of how people thought back in those days. In the 60s, there was a lot going on, but there wasn't anything really about feminist spirituality or goddess energy or any of these kind of things too much in those days. Then shortly after that experience, I had a second experience, which was not a near-death experience, but rather I was trying to sort out what this meant, because it was a serious problem for me. Um, to understand really where I was at that point, they used to have a comedian named Bill Cosby. I don't know how many of you know who, who he was. And at one time he put out a little record that was called something like Noah. And in the record, Bill Cosby's the comedian, and then he's just Noah working away, doing something awesome. And the voice goes, Noah. <laughs> and then he says, yeah, he says, I want you to build an ark. And he goes, am I on candy camera? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I sort of felt like. I felt like a like some kind of freak or something. I, could not I couldn't describe to anybody or even really speak a lot about what my experience was, but my experience was real. And so I decided to start on a journey to discover if there was such a thing as the feminine divine, a goddess, uh, a female version of God. And my girlfriend was Catholic, and so she took me to talk to her, her priest, and he said, no worries, the Virgin Mary. And I said, no, she didn't say she was the Virgin Mary. She said she was God. Well, that can't be. My own minister told me to go and pray that it was Satan. <laughs> um, and uh, one very cool thing was, was my best friend was Jewish, and he hooked me up with this rabbi who really did get me sort of started on the right thing. And he told me, he said, well, God used to be a woman in our religion, but isn't anymore. We don't talk a lot about that. <laughs> So, uh, but I was no theologian, and so I didn't know what that meant or whether it was true or not. But I just kept trying to look and look and look and find the feminine divine somewhere, and I could not find it. Not in any of the mainstream faiths, not in Christianity and Islam and, and Judaism, which were the primary faiths I was really aware of. Um, most of the Eastern faiths, like Hinduism and stuff, had just started to come into the country, you know, but it, it was fairly new, that kind of thing taking place. And so, through a whole series of circumstances I won't go into, I ended up meeting some very early pagans who came to the United States from Europe. And uh, it turned out that they worshipped a god and a goddess. So I thought, well, 
This is about as close as I could get to something that has that in it. And so I moved into that group and made the focus of my life primarily about the goddess. Well, then I had this profound sort of dream that happened fairly shortly after the accident in which she came to me again. And I said, what is it that you want from me? I mean, you know, like, why, why are you talking to me? I'm having enough trouble already, you know, just being a teenager. And she said, I, she said, I want you to serve me. And I said, okay. And here I am, 47 years later, and I'm still doing that. And I think that the thing that was so special about having that experience for me is that in meeting with other men who love or worship the goddess, or the feminine, divine, whatever way they might call it, I've noticed something. Most every one of them has had some profound experience, not always, but some experience that really shifted their consciousness. Maybe not getting hit by a car and get your brain smashed in or something, but some profound experience, a, a vision, a auditory thing, a profound understanding by just merely looking at the world and seeing that there was something that was out of kilter a little bit. So anyway, the goddess didn't tell me to do anything. You know, it wasn't like you'd read in some book in the Bible or something where you come and say, well, you know, do this or do that or such and such. No playbook or anything. I just knew that I had to do whatever work there was. And so in my training in my pagan tradition, one of the first things they talked about was a creation story where they talked about that in the beginning there was the mother of all things. And I'm going to make a short version of the story. She took a piece of herself, sort of, and with it, she made it into light, and she sent it around in a circle, and it became everything in creation. And from that story, I took the idea that everything and everybody has a piece or a part of God, Goddess, within them. And if that's true, then everyone and everything is sacred. And so I came to my own conclusion that the way that I not serve her is to acknowledge the sacredness of every person and all the other things that there are within the world that I live in, but in particular, people. And so I started to look around me and I realized that there are so many people who suffer and who struggle through many different daily human things. And so I decided that I would use my understanding of what the divine was <coughs> to um, try to work with those people and help them and, and lead people, people to some kind of a better place. It didn't take very long for me looking at it from the perspective if God were a mother as opposed to a father in the 60s to recognize that there was a pretty powerful masculine view that overlaid pretty much everything that took place. You know, women were not really allowed to work for the most part. I mean, they were allowed to work, but if they were, they got paid a lot less, and you know, they had to dress up in frilly stuff and go to office parties in order to get a promotion, and all kinds of things, you know, that no one really wants to talk about. And I started thinking, well, there's something really wrong with that. So, I started working with different groups uh, trying to promote the idea of uh, the divine feminine, and some really interesting things started happening in the 70s, and that is this, that because I was connected with the pagan community, who by the way were the primary ones, actually they were really the only ones um, in the United States at least, who were talking about the concept of possibility that could be feminine divinity, um, I started working with some of the women in those groups, and a number of them uh, early on began to talk about the idea of maybe creating feminist spirituality. Realized this didn't exist at that time. And so I actually got to hang out with some of the women who began much of the movements that we have now. And I, I had the honor as a man of um, uh, connecting with a few of the early Dianic communities, which were feminist separatists religious communities, but 
they allowed me, until they trained their own people how to do it, um, there were a lot of problems when the women would try to practice. They worried about men coming to their practices and messing it up somehow. And so I actually got to be probably one of the first people to help guard the sacred circles for women who were experimenting with developing feminist spirituality in the pagan traditions. And so I got to do that for a period of time. And it didn't take very long before women became more empowered about that and they began to replace people like me. But I wasn't the only man who did that. There were a number of other men who showed up to do that too. Then there came a point in that particular part of the movement where I recognized how important it was for women's voices to be heard on their own without men somehow, you know, playing a part in all that. Because we've all had men talking constantly about how men are this and men are that and so forth and so on. So I've done a great deal to try to stay in the background and help women who try to come forward and, and worship the feminine divine. But at the same, same time, I try to always do the work myself because for me, the goddess is the creatrix of all things. She's where everything comes from. You could take any person from any major religion who truly believes in their faith and they profoundly have a belief of God or whatever their deity is to themselves in a very profound way. And that's how she is with me. She's with me all the time. I talk to her all the time. I ask her advice all the time. I let her speak through me all the time. And so I decided to commit myself to doing action to um, help with people having more opportunity to practice religion and spirituality uh, without being hindered. And the reason I ended up taking that direction is because as a pagan coming out of the 60s and 70s, um, I had to battle tremendous amounts of discrimination from other <coughs> religious groups. Um, sometimes very huge things. I had my house firebombed by uh, a number of church groups that came together um, to uh, try to teach me and shift me to the love of Jesus. <laughs> you know, and I know that sounds like a stupid thing, but they actually really believe they were helping me by burning my house down. And I think a little bit of that mentality still exists in places in our country, in the U.S., but also around the world, it's even more powerful sometimes. But uh, I continue to work toward finding ways of helping with religious freedom issues and things like that. And I realized that if I call upon the goddess to help me to do that, and just put myself in her hands, that I would probably do well, because I believe that she had the power to um, make that sort of thing happen. And so over a 40-year period of time, I've gone from working on the streets with the homeless and trying to do work to help them when they were dying and get them to medicine and all the typical things a regular minister of some other faith might do. But I did it as a priest of the goddess. And after a while, people just started accepting me. I got couple jobs in hospitals, working as a chaplain, even though I was, quote, weird. <laughs> and even though that I believed in weird stuff, like that God could be a woman. But over time, fantastic things would happen to me. And over a 40-year period of time, I moved to where, as a single person, speaking all the time from the position of the, the divine as feminine, I've managed to get to where I've spoken to leaders of countries. I've uh, changed the way governments do things. Um, I got to start working in prisons, and I've helped make it so that people from different faiths, including my own, are now able to practice their religion in prisons and be honored in a particular way. I'm standing here at the parliament talking to you. Uh, I was honored in the United States by being able to be the first goddess worshiper to be selected by the United States Commission on Civil Rights to talk about uh, you know, how to accommodate people and such. And so I guess I'm about out of time, but what I really want to convey to you is, is that don't ever think 
that just because there is a huge movement of women who are really claiming their, you know, roots and their connection with the feminine divine that God or Goddess itself is selective. Because if we go that way, we end up in the same place we were before we started. And the divine, the goddess, speaks to men just like she speaks to, to women. And we're all empowered. And I think there needs to be a space left for men to be able to declare that they are empowered and believe in the worship of the goddess. And there isn't a lot of space for that right now. Even within the quote, feminist spirituality movement. And so um, I think that that would be the thing I'd like to leave everyone with, is that make sure that there's a space for men to come out. And men, if it's something you have an interest in, follow all the standard methods that you follow in any other religion to look into it. You know, try praying. One of the things that my minister told me after he told me that if God was a woman, it must be Satan, was that I should go pray to get myself worked out. And so I did go pray, and that's when she appeared to me in this dream and told me to serve her. And I've been doing it ever since. And so, anyway, Michael, thank you. Next, it is my privilege to introduce River Higginbottom. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here at the Parliament and uh, be a, uh, an exhibit for, <laughs> for the notion of she changes everything she touches and everything she touches changes. Because certainly my, uh, my journey into the goddess has been one of change and one that I think is sort of non-typical in, in this world. I have... Um, Grew, grew up in the Midwest in the United States in a very simple little farm town, not too fancy. But uh, I was also uh, uh, gifted uh, by being raised in a, in a Presbyterian uh, Christian home uh, with some very wise and liberal-minded women. And uh, one of the things that my grandmother taught me was uh, do what's right, the value of justice, and think for yourself. Well, they sort of, uh, sort of uh, gave me a lot of permission there to, uh, to uh, do what I needed to do as I grew and, uh, and developed and became, became aware of myself. Uh, and also, uh, I'm, I'm called River, and uh, that's, that wasn't the name uh, I was christened with, but it's, uh, it kind of comes from, from going with the flow. <laughs> and uh, and part of the flow that I went with in my earliest days was to just conform and, and listen to my mothers and my grandmothers and, and go go with the way that they were going. <coughs> but there came a time in life when things shifted for me, where things were no longer no longer filling me. Uh, I went to a dry period. Does that ever happen to any of you? <laughs> So the dry period uh, left me confused and seeking. And, and in the seeking, I began to open my eyes to other possibilities and other dimensions. And I think, I think the, the, world opened, the world opened doors for me that I didn't expect. Uh, about, the, about the age of 27, I, I really was, was wondering, why am I here? What is the nature of my existence? What is the meaning of life? And I didn't have any great answers, but I, I just had, you know, how many questions. And what opened to me gradually was through, through relationships I had with different, different ladies, different friends, uh, I became aware of, uh, of the more subtle aspects of life. I became aware of, of things that I would now identify as more feminine. And, and eventually that led me to discover uh, the pagan community. And, and I had a few profound 
formational experiences. I guess one, the one that was most, most key is uh, I, was, uh, I was meditating outside and I chose to lay down on the hillside and just look at the sky. And, and, and somehow, you know, accidentally, I wasn't trained in any you know, discipline that, that would bring me to, this, to a sense of oneness. But I, I achieved a moment of, or two of oneness, laying on the grass, looking at the sky, and I began to feel entirely cradled and enveloped by the Mother Earth. From that moment, being touched by the goddess, uh, without having a structure or form or, or anything to put it into, uh, but, just, but just a sense of enchantment and engagement. I eventually sought out others who would find the, the same experiences inform their lives. Fast forwarding a little bit, uh, now I'm part of the, the staff of a retreat center where we uh, create opportunities for transformative experiences uh, for women and for men. Uh, this is a community that's about 80% women, and I, I have the uh, distinct uh, wonderful experience of being you know, often in a room filled with women with a lot of excitement and a lot of joy and a lot of passion about being alive. And I, I am as much in the, in the flow of that aliveness, the, in the flow of that uh, love of the goddess, as, as everyone else you know, in that community. And I find that, uh, that some of the most meaningful work that I do uh, is to help others find profound connection. And the profound connection is not necessarily gender. It's usually not. But with the, the imbalance and discord in our culture, in our communities, and the, the disproportionate power that, that uh, males have, particularly white males in the United States, um, I feel like it's my responsibility to work for change, to bring change to our society, and change through, through my own life, as an example, and just to have an open heart but to bring change that will bring us back toward balance, back toward uh, being able to happily and joyously rest in the arms of the mother laying in the hillside. So there's a lot, uh, there's a lot between the, that initial experience on the hillside and being able to stand here and, and uh, share with you a few moments of, of my passion about the connection with the divine, the connection with the divine feminine, and the lightness I feel in my heart for having known and knowing the God. So thank you very much. And next we have Don Lewis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Just when I think, just when I think I've gotten used to the time thing, it changes again. Um, I, I have a few things that I would like to say, which maybe, in some ways, echo what's already been said, and in some ways, are different from what's been said. And that, of course, is the beauty of having more than one person talk. Uh, I believe that God is in everyone, and everyone is in God. God is in everything, and everything is in God. Therefore, God cannot not be feminine. If it exists, it must be part of deity. Um, I come from a family which was very strongly matriarchal and matrilineal. We were very strong on the veneration of our ancestors, and in such a family, the bloodline, the lifeline, is born by the woman. So for me, it's not unusual to think of God in feminine terms. I've lived with it all my life. 
Um, I don't have a great conversion story for you uh, because I did not come to this movement in that way. Um, but I do want to say that um, I feel that it's very important for men who love the goddess to realize that this is a natural thing for us to do. Um, we all of us have elements that are both masculine and feminine. We all have goddess and God within our hearts. We are all connected to all things that exist, and we should respect and venerate all things that exist. And we must understand that this is a natural thing for us to do. Uh, I have a friend in Chicago uh, who is an, a babalao in the Ifa tradition. His orisha is Oshun, a feminine orisha. No one I have met in the Ifa religion considers this in any way odd. Um, I've known men who are Roman Catholic and venerate Mary, and I have not known Roman Catholics to think that is odd. And so, that men venerate the goddess is not odd. It should be natural to us. And as we go forward into future generations, um, my hope is that all pagans can venerate both goddess and God within themselves and within the world around them without feeling that, that this is um, an unusual thing, but rather a very natural thing that comes from one's heart, because that is where it originates. Um, in, the, in the question of how I integrate my love of goddess into my life, I really had a bit of a question for how I wanted to address that. But the answer came to me that it really affects how I look at people and things. Um, I don't have a liturgical answer to that because I feel that my relationship with deity, both as goddess and as God, is similar to everybody else's. But how I look at people is very strongly influenced by the divine feminine and by the qualities one associates with the divine feminine. Um, the Emperor Julian, who was the last pagan emperor of Rome, once wrote uh, a commentary on a biblical passage about a jealous and wrathful God. And what he said was, if your neighbor is jealous and wrathful, you would never say, what a godly man, or what a godly person. You would not consider those good qualities. When I think of God, when I think of God X, I think of love, I think of compassion, I think of what to me are maternal values, I think of God as my mother. Um, and a mother's attitude toward her children is one of support, is one of love, um, is one of wanting to see that child grow and succeed. Uh, and so when I think of God, I don't necessarily think of obedience. I don't necessarily think of anger, or certainly not of jealousy, because what does God have to be jealous of? <coughs> um, what could God be jealous of and still be God? Um, and when I look in people and have to treat people, I look to those same qualities. And that I attribute to the divine feminine, to goddess, uh, to God in, in a neutral term, to spirit, all of which to me have a feminine quality. Um, and I really feel that in emulating Mother God, Mother Goddess, um, we lead a better life. If we can look at people and realize that they're someone's child and treat them as their mother would want them to be treated, we're going to be doing better by them than if we do not think of it that way. Um, and for me, this, this is how the divine feminine influences my spirituality. Um, when we look at the earth, um, in, in my tradition and in most pagan traditions, we think of the earth as the visible manifestation of goddess, as her body. Uh, to me, the entire cosmos is her body. But the earth is a very important aspect of that. And if we look at the earth as the body of our mother, we treat it differently. Uh, if we look at the creatures of the earth, not as something that we have dominion over, but as our siblings, our fellow children of goddess, we treat them differently. Um, and this is what the divine feminine offers to men, as well as to women. It is a different way of looking at the world. And it is something that I feel is for all people will benefit from it. it, it, it um, when we look into ourselves, um, 
we find God and goddess, we find masculine and feminine, we find uh, yin and yang, if you would. And both of these need to be in balance. They both must be developed. And it's just as important for men to find their love of goddess as for women, because it changes your life. Um, and when we, when we realize that we are all children of one mother, and that that mother wants us to be happy, it changes how we're going to treat each other. And if you think of a, of a mother and her relationship with her children, and of course, everyone is an individual. I'm speaking in the generality. But you think of nurturing. And if you can nurture the person next to you, the person that you meet on the street, the person inside you, then you're doing well by the goddess. And you'll be doing better by yourself. And um, to me, that, that is the most important aspect in my life of my relationship with goddess. And so I thank you. of synchronicity, my life seems to really be, you know, wonderfully, uh, all of these symbolic, miraculous events happen when I know I'm doing that well, that sort of seems to validate what I'm feeling on the inside. So I experience, again, sometimes a sense of the transcendent as well as the imminent, and um, to me it also helps me to be ultimately a better man, and to... Uh, really develop a concept of masculinity in my life that is much more healthy and much more balanced. And I think that's all I'll say about that uh, in favor of now opening it up to questions.
I think women have every reason and right to, to protest and object to this long uh, imbalance. But it's a, it's a really complicated question. And um, yes, we can attribute so much of it to the, um, supposedly the Indo-European uh, warlords stampeding across the continent. But as Rosemary Ruther raised, she said, well, she said, how did they get that way? She said, you can't just put the blame on these bad guys. Uh, they all had mothers. Uh, what went wrong? Uh, I'm really skeptical of Gimbutas' uh, old Europe uh, argument. Uh, but again, it raises that same question. If, if there was that matriarchy that was supposed to be so peaceful and uh, egalitarian and so forth, it had to have been, in some respects, so suffocating that you had a universal male reaction. Uh, that's the only way I can see that. But I think that the danger is if, if we, then in rejecting that patriarchal institution, we simply transfer that understanding of God into goddess. Um, it works for some people, and I think it's important in some situations. But where I think the pluralism approach is more uh, all-encompassing, it gives us a, a greater model. I know you don't care for deities as such, and we could we could talk about that for hours. But um, <laughs> Phyllis Corrupt said something. I don't think it was today. It was yesterday about the uh, not wanting to use the word worship. And again, it's been a word that's been misused. And if you really look into the origins of the word worship, it simply means making value. And so when we worship anything a tree or, or a, uh, a deity configuration. We're investing that with value. But the, the thing that distinguishes paganism from the other basic religious orientations, whether it's the Dharmic, the Abrahamic, or even the secular, which calls itself non-religious, but it still is a religious position. What distinguishes paganism is that understanding of enchantment understanding of magic. And our deity projections, whether they're our own fabrications, uh, whatever they are, whether they have an external reality, uh, when we worship them and they are imbued with magic or the enchantment, uh, they're, they're imbued with the miraculous. And that's a word that comes from, it relates to the word mirror, and it also relates to the word smile. And the miraculous, the real miraculous, <coughs> is something that is positive, it's benign, it makes us want to smile, it makes us want to laugh. And it probably came into being when our ancestors first saw their own reflection in the still waters of the well, and it made them smile. So there's this dynamic of the of the miraculous. And so when we have these deity projections or configurations or foci, they are really mirrors. They're divine mirrors that are reflecting the worshiper herself, himself. And so the plurality there, there's something for everybody. My argument with the polytheistic approach is that it creates a, it gives us a, a better model for our own democratic institutions. It's not a patriarchal figure. It's not even a matriarchal figure. It's a whole bunch of deities basically having to cooperate and work together. And that's what we all have to do on this planet.
the feminist movement who are really for women power and men are just basically that's their chips, whatever. <laughs> but also there are who believe in the balance. And I believe I'm one of them who are believe in balance. And so I also am very happy to see the gentleman he, the gentleman here who loves the goddess, who loves the mother aspect of the nature. So uh, then it, I, I have a question then, um, since we're talking about the sacred feminine, the divine feminine, then what about the divine masculine? Um, maybe, I mean, for now, like um, one of you already said, like masculinity would be divine by having cars, having a good job, um, having, you know, uh, nice, nice, having a nice house and whatever, and also can, you know, fight in the bar or something. That's masculinity now. And don't cry. If you're crying, you're not masculine, you're not a man. So I think it's wrong. I sense it's wrong. And I sense that masculinity needs to be redefined. And I wonder, and this applies to actually to all of you, but whoever wants to ask it, do you have your own set of definition of the masculinity now? The new masculinity, or maybe the old one that needs to be revived? Maybe I believe that the current modern masculinity is wrong. It's not broken anymore, and it is really different. Thank you. Now, I'd like to address part of what you said. First of all, um, we all have to be very careful about stereotypes. Um, for example, when I was listening at the, the uh, feminist spiritual, feminine spirituality, feminine divine uh, thing, I work in prisons with both men and women in prisons, and I cannot tell you how many men and women consider they're there because they had no mother who showed up for them. And so, well, there are many, many men who don't show up for them, and that's also quite common. It's very common for women, for just personal reasons, to just dump their kids. And I got thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And so, um, one of the things that um, myself and a couple of the other people who work with me do is to restore this idea of the mother because they don't have one. And so I don't mean that in a negative way, I just mean you just have to be careful of stereotypes and, and uh, you know, the idea that uh, to be a man or what makes you a man or something, you have to be some guy driving around in a pickup truck and so forth and so on. Myself personally, I was the primary parent for three of my children and, uh, you know, I'm the one who fed them, who cooked for them, took them to the school, and things like that. Now maybe that's because I got hit with a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that, there, that that happens in other instances, and I realize it's not as common as not. It's just we have to be careful about stereotypes. And I wanted to uh, address something about the uh, question of, you know, what, are, well, in your question, where's the woman who was just here? In your question, the end of your question was what? Would you just repeat it for me? Uh, how do you define, redefine the masculinity? I mean, what do you see? What's your definition of masculinity? Define yeah, define masculinity. What I actually think this needs to happen is that men, which they are becoming more aware as we move into this kind of information age, you know, I mean, you, you can't hardly be a guy and look on the internet and not get a message that guys can be real jerks. <laughs> no, you don't have to look at the internet. It, it, it's, it's something that, that we're reminded of pretty much every day. And I'm making a joke about it, but it's, it's a, a serious thing. Um, and I think that many men are trying to change that. The thing is, is how do we get down to that deep part of culture that's dug in? I know men who I would speak to about changing their culture or something who don't even have language to talk about that. Uh, for example, the gentleman who brought up the issue, which I thought was a wonderful issue to bring up about, well, you know, if your wife, you know, goes away someplace, who's going to, well, the family's going to fall apart. I think that's a conversation that people really need to have. I don't think it's something to laugh at or anything else like that. It's a very serious conversation because men, many men are trapped in this same story that the women are trapped in. And so it's not like we just grew up naturally thinking, well, you know, we'll just take off and go have a beer and watch TV or do something like that. It's that the people we grew up with taught us to be that way. Somebody mentioned, you know, don't cry. First thing I was taught the first time, some guy popped me in the eye was don't cry. You know, and 
so um, we as men need to learn how to move out of the story just the same way as women are moving out of the story and kind of redefine ourselves as human beings who interact with one another. I also have some thoughts too where, particularly in pagan circles, but I think I really see this starting to creep out into other religious contexts too. The idea of the triple goddess, maiden, mother, and crone, you know, in, in uh, pagan masculine circles, some of us are starting to explore the possibilities represented by archetypes such as the squire, sire, and sage. Um, you know, the squire, the youth, uh, the sire, or the father, and the sage, you know, the wise old man. And I think Jung has some things to say about those archetypes, as well as archetypes represented by king and kingship, and what that represents um, in terms of you know the you know a balanced, just, and fair kind of kingship, um, maybe even a little bit of those um, masculine trickster archetypes, which I tend to indulge in occasionally, and hopefully <laughs> was considered to be a harmless kind of way. Um, I think there's just a lot of richness there that can still be really explored, and we don't necessarily have to flounder around lost, you know. And in a shamanic kind of sense. It's as if we're in the middle of our own journey to find those lost pieces of our soul. And that's where men are right now. It's still very much on that journey. At least, you know, the, some, of the, some of us are co more conscious of doing that maybe than others. But we're trying to make others more conscious, too. And quickly, one more, one more reaction to your question. Uh, for me, the... Uh, the divine masculine is really part of, of a whole where as, as I live and, and try to experience everything in life and, and my own divinity and the divinity of, of, uh, of everything that surrounds me and, and all, of, all of us, uh, I seek balance. <coughs> so I seek to balance uh, the external and the internal. I seek to balance uh, the the active forces and the receptive forces, uh, compassion, and and uh, and so forth. So I, I seek balance, and so for me, uh, the divine, uh, masculine and feminine, are, are parts of that balance. We have we have one more reaction to your question, <laughs> and and what I want uh, two two more coming. <laughs> Uh, what I want to say is I think it's very important to remember when talking about divine masculine or divine feminine that we're not talking about one thing, but a continuum of positive qualities. Every person, whether male or female, is not living one role, but many possible roles according to their personality, according to how spirit moves them, according to their individual desires and talents and wishes in life. And we cannot we cannot have just one stereotype of what it is to be positively masculine or positively feminine. We need to allow everyone the, the full range of experience. And we need to allow our concept of divine masculine and feminine that same full range of experience. And, and let me just, I'll just throw this out. It's very brief. I think that a, a, a true, and we're talking about ma masculine, masculine, what is accurate masculinity. I think a true man is not threatened by the sexual orientation of another man. And I'll just throw that out and let you think about it. But. Thank you.